Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and by the PSEG Foundation. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Hello and welcome to NJ Spotlight News. I'm Raven Santana in for Brianna Venozzi. Ukraine's two largest cities under siege as missiles pummel densely populated areas on day six of Russia's invasion. A 40 mile long Russian military convoy could be seen heading towards Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. The damage to infrastructure has left thousands homeless without electricity or water. The U.N. estimates more than half a million refugees have fled Ukraine since the invasion, finding shelter in Romania, Slovakia and Poland. According to The Washington Post, Poland has welcomed more than 337,000. Across the world, countries have sprung into action to coordinate relief efforts. An emergency appeal for $1.7 billion was launched by the U.N. to urgently deliver essential needs and relief to support those still in Ukraine and refugees who have fled to neighboring countries. Here in New Jersey, rallies and vigils are springing up in a show of solidarity. Last night, Governor Murphy attended a vigil at St. Andrew Ukrainian Orthodox Memorial Church, saying he stood with the state's 75,000 Ukrainian residents. A large crowd gathered to pray and light candles, calling for an end to the war and destruction of human life. Correspondent Joanna Gagas caught up today with Ukrainians marching in Jersey City. How the world will act in response to Ukraine's crisis will go down in history. As the Russian attack on Ukraine intensifies, so too are the voices of Ukrainians here in New Jersey calling for support. A rally in Jersey City brought together members of the Ukrainian community who shared stories about their loved ones overseas. We have a grandmother who is actually of Russian origin. She's from Ural and she lives in Kiev. She's been living there for 60 plus years. She's one of the leading cogeneration scientists of Ukraine. And she's currently in her apartment in Kiev listening to rocket fire and to explosions, and she cannot leave due to her health. During all the nights in Ukraine, friends writing me down, hey, I just wanted to tell you, thank you for your friendship. I'm not sure I'm gonna survive this night. I'm getting messages from my friends, like saying, you know, just leave, leave for all of us. Just stop the war. Natalia Bezpalko's husband is a doctor and a Jersey City resident who traveled to Ukraine before the war started, knowing he'd be needed if conflict broke out. He's there and we're all there with him in spirit and we're doing what we can. We're sending supplies tomorrow. Uh, we got 120 walkie talkies. Uh, we're doing 30 tactical uh, first aid kits. Uh, they need medicine, they need supplies. We're getting more. We're going to Meast in Clifton, New Jersey. We're doing deliveries. Uh, they're shipping them out. They're flying planes every day to Lviv and Poland. And if you guys can donate anything, please do. But today, the calls for support are a little bit different. They're not just asking for money or supplies. They're asking for people here to advocate to their local politicians, asking for the U.S. to do more to stop Russia. No fly zone. Please cover our skies. If anybody here can think about a person you can connect with or advocate to, Please talk about no-fly zone over Ukraine and how important that is. Not once has the Ukrainian president requested American troops. Ukraine stands ready with every tree and rock and man, woman and child ready to fight. They are not asking for troops. Their new slogan is, help us cover our skies. We will do the rest. A no-fly zone instituted by NATO would mean that NATO forces, including the U.S., would engage militarily with any Russian planes spotted in the Ukrainian sky, a move not in the U.S.'s plan at this point in the conflict, even as the International Criminal Court, or ICC, investigates Russia's bombings of Kharkiv yesterday for possible war crimes. The question is whether we should ramp that up to military involvement, and that's a very delicate uh, question because, um, as you know, um, we have nuclear weapons and 
and so does Russia. And of course, Great Britain and France also do. And so any direct military conflict with Russia raises the specter of a nuclear conflict. And that's a nightmare scenario that nobody here in the United States or in Europe wants. But Ukrainians say the U.S. has an obligation to help because of the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, when Ukraine willingly agreed to give up its nuclear weapons in assurance of safety from Russia and the United States. That was not an official treaty, however, and it's not a legally binding agreement. The real question is, can the Ukrainian government, as we now know it, survive? That's uh, probably not likely because the overwhelming military force of Russia, and if Belarus comes into it actively, um, that would be a disastrous um, uh, you know, military situation for the Ukraine government as we now know it. Uh, but you know, um, underground activity will continue, uh, and uh, you know, the ins an insurgency is likely um, to come about, uh, no matter what happens on the military battlefield uh, and whatever the conquest uh, ambitions of Russia uh, and or Belarus might be. So expect continued armed conflict. A dire prediction, less than a week into this war. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. As the state continues to see a decline in the average number of weekly cases, today, 873 new cases and 41 new deaths. New data on Pfizer's COVID vaccine is causing concern for parents and doctors. A report out of New York finds the company's vaccine is much less effective at preventing infection in kids ages 5 to 11 than in older adolescents and adults. Health experts are concerned the news could lead already hesitant parents to skip the shots for their youngest kids. As vaccination rates among the youngest eligible age group have remained low, less than a third of kids ages 5 to 11 as of mid-February. What could this mean as many schools plan to drop mask requirements starting next week? Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. Part of you says, like, why bother? Like, why did I do this? Why did I worry about getting the vaccine? You know, makes you wonder, like, is it worth it? Regina Tully is questioning her decision to get all three of her kids' COVID shots after data from New York showed the ability of Pfizer's vaccine to prevent infections in young children plummets to just 12% after about a month. Tully's kids are 5, 6, and 10. A lot of people did it just so that things could return to normal. On the flip side of it, though, it's like, well, what harm? I haven't heard of any crazy side effects. They decided to pick a dose that would be really safe, but it's not quite as effective. As, as a higher dose. Vaccine experts like Rutgers' Dr. Martin Blazer say Pfizer deliberately erred on the side of caution, cutting the dose for young kids to one-third of the adult shot. The result, data from thousands of New York kids aged 5 to 11 indicate the vaccine's ability to prevent infections dropped precipitously from 68 to 12 percent in just over a month. It did better at stopping hospitalizations, where efficacy dropped from 100 to 48 percent, but compare that to older kids who got regular doses and still had 51% protection from infection, 73% protection from hospitalization. The general theory is that some vaccine is better than no vaccine. So I think it was a reasonable decision. In retrospect, they would have done better if they had a higher dose, but they didn't know. There was a level of comfort in knowing that your children were at least vaccinated with one or two doses and that, that that would reduce the possibility that they would come home and spread the virus. Um, I think that's being taken away now, unfortunately. Epidemiologist Stephanie Silvera now fears what might happen when the mask mandates lifted at New Jersey schools on Monday, but kids' vaccinations aren't as protective as once believed. And now we are sending children 5 to 11 into schools with limited protection against Omicron and potentially the next variant. I, I think it's going to send everybody into a tailspin. Silvera would also like to see New Jersey's health department provide data similar to New York's, showing vaccine performance over age groups. So would Senator Holly Shapizzi, who wants more legislative input on vaccine regulations, although COVID shots aren't currently required in New Jersey for kids under 18. Before we entertain any sort of additional mandates, we have to understand scientifically as to whether or not these shots in these age groups are even doing what they're supposed to be doing. Shapizzi has a 10-year-old son who got COVID over the summer. Will she get him vaccinated now? I'm absolutely going to wait. 
I see no reason to go and get him vaccinated at this moment in time, as the numbers have decreased so significantly, where the efficacy rate of this particular um, you know, vaccine drops to 12% in one month. Another mom reached the same conclusion. Amanda Sulikowski has daughters who are seven and 10. And we're not gonna rush off to vaccinate them, especially with these findings coming out. What's next? Pfizer would need FDA approval for a kid booster or a bigger dose. You know, how do you, how do you find the sweet spot? That, that's the problem. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Nurses and other health care workers have been praised as heroes throughout the pandemic. But now, after nearly two years, some are ditching their scrubs before going out in public in fear of harassment or being assaulted due to their chosen profession. As the rising violence among health care workers continues, a new piece of legislation is being introduced here in Jersey to protect employees by increasing penalties for those convicted of threat or violence towards them. Melissa Rose Cooper reports. The pressures put on Healthcare workers, not just at the bedside, but in the facility are so great. The last thing they need to think about is, you know, their own physical safety when they're on the work site. Yet Douglas Plaka, executive director for the Healthcare Labor Union, Genesco, says it's something they do have to worry about now all the time. One of our nurses down in a South Jersey facility actually was hit over the head with a two by four of a family member um, who came into the uh, emergency department. Um, and obviously, you know, it was out of work for quite a long time. I mean, those types of assaults, uh, unfortunately, especially in an emergency department, happen way too often. So Plaka and other health advocates are applauding state lawmakers for taking steps to offer more protection. Assembly Majority Leader Lewis Greenwald and Senator Troy Singleton are sponsoring a bill known as the Healthcare Heroes Violence Prevention Act. If passed, Anyone found guilty of abusing a person working at a healthcare facility would face a tougher punishment than what is on the books now. The current sentencing guidelines for an assault are uh, third degree, three to five years imprisonment, up to $15,000 fine or both, and a fourth degree up to 18 months and up to a $10,000 fine or both. So, you know, this would give greater discretion uh, to the judge and would allow them to impose stricter penalties, uh, taking it from a disorderly offense to a third or fourth degree crime. Violence against healthcare workers has been a growing concern for years, even pre-pandemic. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, they're five times as likely to suffer a violent workplace injury than any other profession. In 2018, healthcare workers accounted for 73% of all non-fatal workplace injuries and illnesses due to violence. And things have only gotten worse since COVID-19 began. Just think about patients coming in. They're, they're already uh, feeling anxiety, stress, uh, fear. Uh, certainly with COVID, you know, we, we saw an increase in uh, behavioral health issues. Uh, substance abuse, alcohol abuse. So a, a lot of it is people coming in that are already under stress and then kind of trying to navigate the healthcare system. What we do is impactful, it's meaningful, it's purposeful. We, we help people heal. We should not be getting hurt on the job by people that are, um, you know, assaulting our staff or threatening our staff. And while health advocates agree, the proposed legislation creating stricter penalties for violent offenders is a step in the right direction, they still think more needs to be done. I just wish, wish it would go a step further, it, you know, in terms of making it perhaps a felony for assaulting a healthcare worker. And now out in the public, if you assault somebody on the street, you could be not only put in jail for quite some time, hefty fines, but obviously being on your record for a, a long time, you know, to, to take it further, I think would be ideal. The proposed legislation includes a provision that would recommend the offender to perform community service in addition to sentencing, depending on the severity of an attack. Advocates are hoping it will also serve as a deterrent. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Even as the state has dramatically reduced its prison population, almost 500 people incarcerated in New Jersey are age 65 or older. 
Many of them suffer from a host of conditions including diabetes, liver disease, visual learning and hearing impairments. Advocates and experts say prisons were not designed for elderly inmates and are not equipped to handle their special needs. Yet the war on drugs, mandatory minimum sentences and a parole system that does not tend to release people convicted of violent crimes even when the data suggests they are unlikely to reoffend is forcing correctional facilities to keep inmates longer and try to meet the needs of seniors behind bars. So why aren't inmates' ages taken into account? Writer and special projects editor Colleen O'Day joins me to discuss her reporting. Colleen, your article calls this a problem with the state prison system. Why do you say that? You know, prisons were not built for older people. I mean, they were built for people who have no trouble ambulating, you know, who don't have serious illnesses, who can, you know, feed themselves and get around. Um, and more and more as the, the prison population ages, we're finding that there are people with, uh, you know, a, a whole host of problems that, that older people have out here, although um, prison is known to age a person. And so mm -hmm. when we talk about geriatric prisoners, we think of people more like age 50 and over rather than 65 and over. And the state's now got about 2,600 people who fall into that category. It's about two in 10 prisoners. And that's a lot of folks who need care. You know, inmates over 50, like you said, are accounting for an increasing percentage of the state's total prison population. But why is it growing so fast? So, you know, part of this is really due to that old, um, you know, tough on crime, mandatory minimum sentences uh, kind of mentality that we've had for, you know, for quite a while. I mean, you know, some of that is changing, but there are a lot of people who are in um, under mandatory minimum sentences, so they really can't get out earlier. And then there's a there was really an issue with the parole system because even folks, once they do become eligible for parole, um, if if you've been convicted of a violent offense, it's it's quite difficult. The data shows to to get out on on parole, um, despite the fact that the older a person gets, the less likely they are to reoffend. You know, Colleen, and what toll has the aging prison population had on the Department of Corrections? There's um, certainly it's getting more and more expensive to care for these folks. You've got people with um, diabetes, asthma, cancer, heart disease, um, kidney dialysis. Folks need to go out, you know, two or three times out of the prison uh, to go to the hospital to get dialysis. So you've got um, more and more, uh, the prisons are needing to provide uh, medical care as well as mental health care. Uh, Southwood State Prison has a section now that is essentially a hospice unit for uh, for folks who are who are dying to go in, and they need obviously tremendous care. Um, so this is getting expensive. Um, it's a hard thing for for corrections officers to who, who may not be properly trained to deal with. Um, you know, it's and, and it's hard for the families of the folks who are on the outside um, to kind of know that these things are happening, you know, to relatives inside and that perhaps they're not getting the best care they could get if they were outside in, and able to go to, a, you know, to regular doctors to to a hospital when they need to. Colleen, per usual, excellent reporting. Thank you for speaking with me about this. And I appreciate your time as always. Thank you, Raven. For more of Colleen's reporting on the state's aging prison population, head to njspotlightnews.org. The price of a barrel of oil is topping a seven-year high, forcing global reserves to be released. Rhonda Schaffler joins us with more on the impact the Russian invasion is having on the economy and all the other top business stories. Rhonda? Raven, Russia's invasion of Ukraine sent oil prices surging above $100 a barrel in the U.S. today, a seven-year high. To try to keep prices in check, a global consortium agreed to release oil from global reserves. The head of the International Energy Agency described the situation in the energy markets as very serious, adding global energy security is under threat putting the world economy at risk. As we've been reporting, New Jerseyans are extending their support to Ukraine, and companies are too. Jersey City-based Goya Foods is distributing hundreds of thousands of pounds of food to Ukraine and Poland, now home to thousands of refugees. Numerous other companies are also responding, including Airbnb, which will provide free short-term housing for refugees. 
Elsewhere, one of New Jersey's most prominent CEOs is retiring. Barry Ostrowski, the CEO and president of RWJ Barnabas Health, will retire at the end of this year. Mark Manigan, chief strategy and business development officer, will assume the role of president and then take over as CEO on January 1st of next year. President Biden is expected to push for clean energy tax credits during his State of the Union address tonight, asking Congress to address climate change. At PSEG in New Jersey, the company is touting its climate commitment. Chief Operating Officer Ralph LaRosa highlighted recent steps taken. I think our move uh, that we've just announced, where we've uh, divested ourselves from our fossil fuel uh, generating plants, is a strong indication of our commitment to clean energy as well as our uh, commitment to our offshore wind uh, uh, efforts here in New Jersey. Finally, a long-standing tradition here in New Jersey, a ban on pumping your own gas could be coming to an end under a bipartisan bill introduced in the Assembly. The legislation would require gas stations with four or more pumps to continue offering full service, but other gas stations could offer self-service. New Jersey is the only state in the country that bans self-service. That law has been on the books since 1949. On Wall Street, both the New York Stock Exchange and the Nasdaq have suspended trading of stocks of Russian companies following U.S. sanctions. Now we want to take a look at the closing numbers from Wall Street today. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Big changes are on the horizon in Trenton thanks to new maps recently adopted for the state legislature. Political watchers in New Jersey have been focused on two districts where Democratic incumbents would be pitted against each other in next year's legislative primary elections. One of those standoffs was diffused last week in Hudson County when Nicholas Sacco announced he would retire rather than run against Brian Stack in the reconfigured 33rd district. But in Essex County, the prospect of an intra-party fight remains between Nia Gill and Richard Cody two state senators who will soon share the newly redrawn 27th district. Senior political correspondent David Cruz reports. Myself and Senator Gill had a very, very good conversation. And we're going to leave it that way. So we're good. Senator Dick Cody has been around a long time. He goes back to the assembly in 1974 and has had all the big jobs since then, including Senate president and governor. He knows that a 2023 primary made possible by redistricting that puts him and Senator Nia Gill in the same 27th district is still a long time away, and anything can happen in politics over the course of a year. But observers believe if the party had to choose between Cody and Gill today, it probably would give the line to Cody. And Senator Gill will be forced to run off the line. Now, the interesting thing about that, David, is that both of these really strong, exceptionally strong candidates have both, they're some of the few people in this state who can actually say that they've run off the line and won. This potential matchup between two veterans and the ripple effect it sends down the line are the result of redistricting, a party-based process that tries to match voters to representatives by a number of criteria, most frequently race. It's a mix of social engineering and direct marketing. We have redistricting where parties get to decide how, um, how they're going to draw these lines, pit some people against each other, decide how many people of color will be in a certain district, which makes a huge, which has a huge role in deciding if those voters have actually the power to elect a candidate of their choosing. And then you have the line. It's a real issue and it creates a huge disadvantage. And we're seeing that right now. The map that created the new 27th district moves Montclair and Clifton into what was the old 27th. Montclair is Senator Gill's home base, but it's now in what had been Cody's district. Gill wasn't talking today, although she has told others that she intends to run on or off the line. The irony is that 
the possibility of a more diverse 27th district to produce a candidate of color seems diminished to the point where, depending on how much you follow the sometimes arcane party rules of succession, you could see a Cody ticket that includes veterans Tom Giblin and John McKeon as assembly candidates, three white guys, which would be quite noticeable in this day and age in Essex County. In this one district where, we, where incumbents are pitted against each other, white voters have the biggest say. So we're going to see what that means for who they elect. I think as we grow as a society, Dave, um, black and brown and white uh, eventually can run anywhere. Um, I've, we have in the city of New York a district as Junda was represented by three women. Uh, great. Uh, two who are uh, Latino and one who is um, African American. And, you know, it's, it's a good thing. It's worth repeating, but these theoretical primaries are more than a year away, and nobody wants a bruising primary with racial and gender undertones. Democrats, we're assured, are going to work it all out and survive another period of unrest. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. And that does it for us tonight, but tune in Wednesday for one of our NJ Spotlight News online virtual roundtables looking at warehouse growth here in New Jersey. Contributing writer John Hurdle moderates a panel of experts exploring the warehouse construction boom and some of the opposition surrounding it. That's tomorrow, March 2nd at 4 p.m. Head to njspotlightnews.org to register. I'm Raven Santana. Thanks for joining us tonight, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.